This podcast is intended for a mature audience over 19 years of age and is provided on an educational and informational basis. Any material presented is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as a substitute for professional medical advice or as an endorsement or medical claim by Patterson Media, Everything Podcasts, or any advertiser. There's a very good reason marijuana is illegal. Last year, it killed 480,000 people. Four, oh, no, never mind, that's tobacco. Sorry. Marijuana killed 140,000 people last year. Oh, alcohol. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, 500. It's got to be 500. This is a dangerous illegal substance. We must ban it. We cannot let it be legal. We are talking about a substance with no lethality. The war on drugs was an abject failure that put tons of people in prison based on faulty reasoning and faulty science. Today on the Canadian Podcast. We would hire people, right? And as people came in to do the work, they also wanted to become involved in the industry. And after a while, holy smokes, there was like so many people growing weed. Part two of the life and crimes of Don Briere. Don ran over 30 gray area dispensaries across six provinces before cannabis was legal. He was behind the first storefront in North America to sell cannabis to anyone who asked. Dekine, smoke and beverage. In the last episode, Don told us the story of his pre-storefront years as an illegal grower, right up until he got busted. Right in front of my truck, there's this young guy, right? And I'm looking at his off. It looks like we're getting ready to <laughs> Man, they just came in like guns up in the air and they had their battle plans on all bullshit. And it was like up against the wall and holy f- it was something else, right? For part one, you can go back to the last episode of the Canadian podcast. If you've already heard it, then keep listening. Don's weed shops largely closed after legalization. So we're talking to Jacqueline Peyota. She's the executive director at the Retail Cannabis Council of British Columbia, and she advocates for better regulation and assistance for cannabis businesses. The representation that was at the table in the run-up to legalization, I don't think particularly accurately reflected the reality of the Canadian cannabis sector. So what we saw was a lot of consultation with big corporations. Jacqueline will be here to tell us how legalization didn't help people like Dawn or underrepresented groups like BIPOC people and women after the latest pot news. With the latest pot news, I'm Jake Hoburn. Health Canada has announced an additional $1.4 million in funding for a project exploring cannabis substitution of alcohol as a component of managed alcohol programs at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. This was part of an announcement of more than $20 million to help address harms related to substance use across BC and the prairies. In Europe, Germany has published a draft of the bill that will begin cannabis legalization in the country. The bill uses a cannabis association model in which members of an association will be able to take home up to 50 grams per month. This doesn't legalize fully commercial cannabis operations. It's expected that that will come in a later second phase with a second bill. Germany is calling this a two-pillar approach. And the Manitoba government is putting an end to the social responsibility fee on cannabis retailers. The province had required retailers to pay the 6% fee from November of 2022, supposedly to help cover the social costs of cannabis legalization. The change is retroactive to January 1st, 2023, so most of the fees paid will be reimbursed. That's the Pot News. I'm Jay Coburn. Back to you, Don. Jacqueline Peyota is the Executive Director at the Retail Cannabis Council of British Columbia. She's also very familiar with the regulatory framework in BC and all of the obstacles and hurdles there are to selling cannabis legally. She advocates for better policy, but we also wanted to talk to her about representation in the cannabis industry, like who gets to sit at the table when it comes to discussing making the law around cannabis. Jacqueline sat down with our producer, Karen, to answer those questions. She started her cannabis journey when her dad was terminally ill and struggling to get medical cannabis. I started working with a group that was 
actually advocating to decriminalize cannabis. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, essentially, we had this announcement from you know our current prime minister that cannabis legalization was now on the table. We have been consulting with provinces, with municipalities over the past years on the legalization of marijuana, and we will continue to engage and improve and move forward in thoughtful ways on bringing in the right regime. And when that happened, I actually left my job. I come from a background with telecom and insurance uh, with an association background. And I actually left my job in the Insurance Workers Association to full-time work as a cannabis advocate. I started with a group that was advocating for producers in Canada, small producers specifically, what we call kind of like micro license holders. And then gradually I became much more involved in the regulatory side of things. I started doing federal cultivation and processing licensing. And then I got really involved in land use on the cannabis file. One of the unfortunate facts of the matter is in BC, it is very hard to find a place to do cannabis business. And then that resulted in getting connected with retailers who were in the process of transitioning from the unregulated space into a licensed space. And when that happened, they asked if I might be interested in helping them talk to government about a couple of things that were obviously going to be challenging in the new legal system. And it kind of escalated from there. The most important thing I think about our work at RCCPC and kind of my work in the cannabis sector is I try to always remember where the sector came from. So how did we get here? Who built the sector before legalization? Who is responsible for, you know, the large scale push to like destigmatize cannabis? And, you know, how can we ensure that we don't leave those folks behind? Because obviously we've had a lot of challenges in the legal system in Canada and I think that those challenges are best illustrated by the fact that we have really failed to do a lot of significant transition on the part of the production side of things. Specifically, you know, legacy cultivators and also Indigenous partners, like those have been pretty significant failures. So those are the kind of the guiding principles, some of the guiding principles behind the work that we do at RCCPC. So during your advocacy, when you're going to lawmakers, when you're talking to politicians, tell me, how was that being a woman representing cannabis industry? Honestly, I think that stigma is something that we live with as cannabis professionals and cannabis enthusiasts and cannabis consumers every day. It is unfortunate that the normal obstacles that young women find in terms of trying to find their way in structures of power was redoubled in a lot of ways because of the sector that I was participating in. Conversely, I think that it's interesting to think about how if it wasn't for the stigma around cannabis, chances are there wouldn't have been room for me as a woman with my background as a, you know, a medical advocate, etc., if there had not been that stigma, because what we would have seen would have been, you know, much more traditional power structures fill those leadership roles in cannabis. So it's, I find it kind of ironic that the ongoing struggle that we have with stigma has actually created some spaces for leadership on the part of women and to some extent, but on a very limited level of people of color and our indigenous partners as well. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. (laughs) Going into meetings and being not only the only cannabis enthusiast in the room, but also the only woman can be daunting, especially when you are dealing with something that is, I think, generally perceived by our regulators and government as a problem that they have to deal with, as opposed to an economic development opportunity. I think that that has been very challenging for regulators to really wrap their heads around. We're just starting to see it now five years into legalization. Do you feel when legalization happened, there was representatives of the multitude of cannabis users, enthusiasts, or people who are growers, producers in the room? The representation that was 
at the table in the run up to legalization, I don't think particularly accurately reflected the reality of the Canadian cannabis sector. Thanks so much for doing the minutes. I uh, wanted to uh, see if there's any public comment before we move to the agenda. So what we saw was a lot of consultation with big corporations that were doing this under the Marijuana for Medical Purposes regulations, the MMPR. So it is an unfortunate fact of the matter that in addition to the challenge of kind of failing to transition our legacy growers, that's emblematic and indicative of the underlying sin of cannabis regulation in Canada. So no, I do not think that when we were doing consultation originally, there was any kind of meaningful consideration given to women in cannabis, to you know, BIPOC folks in cannabis, to Indigenous partners in cannabis. And I think that that's really unfortunate because the sector is and was significantly female like there is a very significant portion of the workforce that makes this sector go round that are women and they are often pushed to the background where we have personalities that are up front that tend to have a specific kind of profile they tend to be white they tend to be wealthier they tend to be men those have been the faces of the sector to this point, right? Like you look at the C-suite of Aurora or Canopy or Hexo, like we're not seeing a lot of female voices. We're not hearing a lot of BIPOC or Indigenous voices. It's a lot of the very business as usual corporate structure type stuff that we're seeing at the business level. And I think that if the government is drawing their perception of the culture of the cannabis sector from those publicly traded companies, they would be very misinformed as to the demographics of the people that actually make up this sector. Because I don't think that those voices and those people that have necessarily been platformed by media, both domestically and internationally, are necessarily reflective of what we're actually dealing with in this country. I went to different events for cannabis. I was so astonished to see so many speakers, so many businesses, so many ideas coming from female founders. But the big ones, they're always represented by men. But those with amazing ideas, amazing research, even amazing things going on, they were always women. They were passionate about it. I can sense the passion when they speak compared to the passion about when it's coming from a male. It was so different. I felt that they love it more or they understand it more or they feel its power more. And do you feel this disparity is still going on? The power struggle between women and men in the cannabis industry, either in the political level or the corporate level? Well, it's probably amplified because we're daylighting the sector in a way that is reflective of a broader social situation, right? Like the C-suites of the majority of large companies are not populated by women, right? Like that is a fact of the matter. This is not a challenge that is specific to cannabis, but I think it is more disappointing in cannabis because we had an opportunity because we're daylighting the sector, right? We're building this from the ground up. We had an opportunity, especially like at a government level and at a regulatory level to really build systems that could meaningfully elevate and potentially even the playing field, because that's what we're talking about here, for groups that have been traditionally marginalized in business. Unfortunately, Canada has not done a particularly good job of that. If this is really a new opportunity, should we not as a society, as our government and our regulators be looking at cannabis as a tool to uplift Canadians and specifically to uplift you know, folks who've been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs? and stigma around drugs. I speak to a lot of parents who internalize this stigma because they're concerned about the knockdown impact of them, their cannabis use on their children. So I do think that we have an opportunity in Canada, especially with the fact that they're reviewing the Cannabis Act, to you know go back to the drawing board and really start to thoughtfully consider how we can ensure that the sector is the sector that we want, right? Like the sector that, in my opinion, it would be beneficial to have a strong small business presence. Those are things that we want to see fostered. Do you think, is it because of the stigma of being it run by a woman that can be a parent and whatever comes with it? Or it's, there is not enough interest in the subject by the government? 
I think the barriers to entry are pretty significant. And I think that tr- traditionally barriers to entry have impacted women more than they've impacted men. By that, I mean things like, as you said, parenthood, right? Like, so owning your own business and being a parent can be very challenging. But also things like navigating, you know, financial apparatuses. So trying to find like a bank account or funding or what have you. These things tend to be a very male dominated realm and they're very challenging to navigate in cannabis in a way that is very hard I think for other established sectors to really appreciate like the simple act of finding a bank account can be very challenging in cannabis so what we need to think about is grant programs for instance from the government that look at you know women-led businesses or you know indigenous-led businesses or BIPOC-led businesses and really like look at those and go okay these are incredibly important parts of this ecosystem and we need to support them we need to find a way to shore them up create situations where there might be training or even very basic financial supports because right now it's not as if you could as a woman you know entrepreneur that you could go and apply for like a grant right there are lots there are grants available to female entrepreneurs in other sectors but not in cannabis like it's just not an option so as we navigate legalization, as we, you know, the sector matures and develops and becomes less of a transitional activity and more of a, an established industry, our government should be really focused both federally and provincially in creating those kinds of programs. That was Jacqueline Peota, Executive Director of the Retail Cannabis Council of British Columbia. Now back to the story of Dom Briere. It's time for part two. If you haven't heard part one, it's in the previous episode. You can go back and check it out. Here's Don. I made the news when they busted me because we had such a large grow up. When we left Don in the last episode, he'd just been raided and sentenced to four years in prison. 2004. Don has served a third of his time, and he's out on parole. He has a criminal record as one of the biggest cannabis growers in British Columbia. Any wrong steps, any run-ins with law enforcement could see him back in prison. In other words, not the perfect time to start openly selling illegal drugs. So I decided that I'm not going to take the bullshit from the people, and I started looking at opening up a smoke and beverage shop. Called the kind means the best. So the kind smoke and beverage shop, and that's what we opened up. The kind. That's spelled D A K I N E. It's a Hawaiian phrase that gets thrown around a lot in different contexts. I'm not going to pretend I'm an expert on Hawaiian culture, but as best I can understand, it loosely means the thing. It implies something is real, it's genuine. And now it was the name of Don's pot store. Or, at first, Don's Compassion Club. This wasn't meant to be North America's first full-blown storefront dispensary at first. They were just going to be providing medical cannabis, which had been legalized in 2001. If you want to hear that story, check out episode three of the Canadian podcast. We were going to be a compassion club. So, you know, you had to have a doctor's note, you had to have all this kind of stuff, right? And a lot of people were coming in and they just didn't have it. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, well, what can I do here? I really wanted just to have it as a cannabis store, right? The way that Don tells the story, he almost didn't have a choice. He tried to follow the law, but reality butted up against the law. And one day he made a snap decision. And so one day, these guys come walking in and, man, they looked like they were in pretty bad shape. They were filthy. They were dirty. They were shaking. They were like begging me for weed. And I said, look, this is all you need to do is go see a doctor, get a prescription, and no problem, I'll take care of you, just like that. And they said, well, we've been to the park, and we tried to get some weed because we're on hard drugs, and we can't get it. They won't give it to us. All they say is we got this stuff here, crack or heroin, whatever the hell it is, right? And we want to get weed to ease the pain, to get off of The hard drugs were just really trying hard. And these guys were pretty much crying. And so I decided, screw it. They're going to get it. And so I just sold them some weed. Yeah, they were so grateful. It was like 
Unbelievable. And for four months, they just sold cannabis, openly on Commercial Drive in Vancouver. They were the first storefront selling cannabis to anyone who asked for it in North America. Well, you walk in the door, and most people that have smoked cannabis are just thrilled. <laughs> like, they're like, this is all sitting right there, bags right there. We had people in the back bagging that stuff. We didn't have enough room. There was people just stuffing bags, continuing, wait, stuff it, wait, stuff it. It was going out the door so fast, we could barely keep up. I mean, people were knocking on the door in the morning. People were coming all day. There was lineups out the door. And then we had girls with trays, and they were going around giving butter hoots, you know? It's like a, a hot knife, you know, with a torch. Heat up the knife and put a dab on there. It was five bucks. And man, again, they couldn't keep up to it. It was pretty cool. Dekine was operating kind of under the radar, but still getting attention. The store even became something of a tourist attraction to a certain type of tourist. We had somebody fly in from New Jersey. They said that they had been going to Amsterdam for their holidays every year for the last 10 years. And when they heard about the kind, they diverted over to here. It was on social media, whatever social media was available at the time, right? And then they, they came in from the airport with their suitcases on. They spent a lot of money in town. They said they were here for two weeks and they came into our store every day. I got to know them on a personal basis. And there was a little old lady, she's talking to me and she says, yeah, I heard about this place. I drove up from Alabama, all the way from Alabama so I could smoke weed here without worrying about the long arm of the law grabbing me from behind. While tourists and local customers allowed the store a roaring trade, the police didn't receive any complaints and the people got their weed. Don was back in business. Until... Meanwhile, a Vancouver store is creating a huge controversy tonight by selling marijuana over the counter to anyone who walks in and wants to buy some. The Dekine Cafe on Commercial Drive. The Dekine Shop on Commercial Drive. The media found out that some guy came up and says, yeah, we're going to open up a whole bunch of stores all over the place. And as soon as that hit the news, then the news people came down. Suddenly, Dekine was internationally famous. I think it was Bush said, and our friends to the north are too lenient on whatever. And it was like amazing because once it hit the news, it was like all over the world. And so anyways, there was a lot of pressure on to have this place shut down. Dekine did close early on the day of the news report, swamped by the media and a deluge of potential buyers. But the next day, they were back open for business selling cannabis. There was TV antenna vans all over the place because it was out for nine days. They had police on the roof watching it. They had police cars driving back and forth. There were lineups out the door. As soon as people heard that, there was like huge mobs of people coming down there trying to buy weed, right? And it was amazing. This put the Vancouver political establishment and the police under a lot of pressure. If you're in charge of law enforcement and someone has been openly breaking the law, selling what was at the time an illegal drug to anyone who asked, well, you looked a bit silly when your best defense is, we didn't notice. Without the police having the information in regards to any complaints or having this come up on our radar before, we were unaware of it. In that kind of environment, it was only a matter of time until the police acted. We were open for another nine days before the raid hit. Yeah, it was pretty wild. Came in with 45 cops, balaclavas, guns drawn. They just missed me. I got out the back door just in time. And there was cops running towards the back door. And I looked at a cop and he was looking at me and I smiled, gave him a wave, and just kept on walking. And right behind me, I heard a big police. And so the cop ran down there and he jumped on whoever was coming out the back door. But I was already maybe 15 feet away from the back door and I guess they didn't notice me coming out. So I went up and around the block, came back down and they had shut the street off. They had the warrant at 10 in the morning, but they waited for the six o'clock news. So the police had raided Dekine and Don Briere, remember, still out on parole, had escaped. At this point, you probably already know what a guy like Don did. I went and got some weed. We opened up the next day. The police had left some cannabis in the store. Don thinks they probably just couldn't take it all with them. Don Briere was again back in business. Again until... I was going to get some more weed, and all of a sudden I was coming down the freeway. 
I think it was a Sunday, and I noticed like there was seven or eight cars behind me. And every time I changed lane, they all changed lane like a snake following me behind me, right? That's when they nailed me and they got me right on First Avenue in Vancouver. And so of course they took me away. Don's wife, Carol, tried to reopen the store again in his absence, but it just got closed down again. So that was pretty much the end of the story there, right? I was on parole, so I went back to jail. <laughs> and my parole officer, he was just pissed. <laughs> oh, man, he, he, he was in front of the judge, and he was, this guy is already ratting and raving. He was so angry, spit was coming out of his mouth. So anyways, back to Pacific Institute, which was a maximum prison. And Don was sentenced to another two and a half years in prison. He served a sixth of that. And while I was on parole, <laughs> while I was on parole, I got a medical license to grow plants. And I had 22 of them in the backyard in big pots, six feet tall. You want to see the look on my parole officer's face? Priceless. I had a license and he couldn't do anything about it. He may have gone back to prison, but that wasn't the end for weed stores in Canada. Don had shown people what was possible. The police can close down one pot store, but when a bunch of stores start opening doing the same thing, it moves from a law enforcement issue to a political issue. Once we had the store open, there was other people that had other stores around too, right? Just a little smaller, less open than we were. We had a big neon sign right in the window. The kind smoke and beverage shop. And so the word got out really fast. I mean, all it takes is, hey, buddy, you still in Toronto? Well, guess what? We got a pot store in Vancouver. The prison sentence wasn't the end for Don's less than legal entrepreneurship either. By the time he got out, the political atmosphere had shifted. Lawmakers in Vancouver and other cities had softened on cannabis enforcement, and police weren't quite so zealous in their raids. At that time, the mayor and city council said, leave cannabis stores alone. They're wasting time and money. They're not doing anything bad. Hey, listen, you know, people are dying by fentanyl, okay? How many people are you going to let die while you're raiding a pot store? Or you're going to be in court dealing with this? So, in this new legal gray area, Don Briere went ahead and started a new venture. Eventually, a real chain of stores selling an illegal product across Canada. Over 30 of them, across six provinces at its peak. The main chain was called Weeds, Glass, and Gifts. Eleven of them were Weeds, Glass, and Gifts. And one was The Joint, and the other one was a Mary Jane's. And 13 out of 33 stores in Vancouver. And I opened up in 2013 with $13,000. <laughs> he was never arrested again, although the stores were raided 22 times. Don is happy that legalization finally came. Even though it cost him most of his stores, Almost all of them are closed now, unable to get licenses or comply with various provincial regulations. Two remain in Vancouver and Seashelt, B.C. The rollout was terrible. They didn't consult anybody who was in the industry, really. They gave it to a bunch of people. It's like, okay, you know, you're a fantastic farmer, but I want you to fly my airplane for me. These days, Don lives mostly at his farm in British Columbia, where he grows a bunch of his own weed. He considers himself semi-retired, but still wants to open more stores. After all this time in the business, we asked him about how he feels about his part in the fight to legalize cannabis. We're kind of proud of it, but you know, I paid a heavy price, so did my family and so did my friends. I'm not just the only one. There's a lot of other people that paid a heavy price as well for cannabis, right? I met people in, in prison who were cannabis people, and they were in prison, right? We fought wars for democracy, and people died for democracy, and this is our freedom, and this is our right. And of course, who could sit down with Don Breer without asking him what his favorite type of weed is? All of it. <laughs> <laughs> I like sativas in the morning, hybrids during it in the middle of the day, and then because at night. And I like eating it, and sometimes I drink it too. So it's beauty about cannabis, you can do whatever you want with it. A huge shout out to Don Briere for sitting down with us to tell his story. You can find out more about Don and his cannabis stores at weedsgg.ca. I hope you can join us for the next episode of the Canadian Podcast. 
hit the subscribe or follow button to make sure you do. And while you wait for the next episode, check out westernbuzz.ca. The Canadian Podcast is an everything podcast production in partnership with Panison Media. The opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the views of the podcast team or our partners. This show is intended for a 19-plus audience and is magically put together with help from Cliff Dumas, Karen Habashi, Jay Coburn, and John Massacar. Thanks, guys. I'm Don Schaefer. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Canadian Podcast, the authority on cannabis in Canada. Another Everything Podcast production. Visit everythingpodcast.com, a division of Patterson Media. Subscribe wherever you get your podcast.